We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everybody. Uh, I am representing the team of the organizers. We, we have the group of the different organizations which uh, go to the same conclusion to, to, to have this debate today. Uh, <clears throat> I personally advise to the Polish government on blockchain policy, uh, and I also try to um, organize a dialogue uh, with business. Uh, so I'm also the participate in the creation of the European debate on the in the policy group of European blockchain partnership. Uh, I would extend my uh, warm welcome to all panelists and participants, especially to those uh, who have not been put off by today's difficulties of connecting online. Uh, it, is, it seems blocking the possibility of discussing internet uh, freedom is by somebody shows that uh, that attitude towards this freedom is really complex problem. Uh, our idea for the session is based on the two assumptions. The one is uh, that uh, there is a clear need for regulatory challenges uh, for blockchain. Uh, the second is the community of internet people should realize that the blockchain can herald change really change. I would, like, I would like to give the space for, the, for moderating uh, the discussion to Jacek. Um, welcome, Jacek. Uh, thank you, Piotr, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to moderate this event. Uh, the Internet Governance Forum is, is an excellent conference, um, and the agenda is full of important topics. Um, yet, I, I dare to say that the topic that we will be discussing at this panel is one of the most important ones, um, and, and makes me very happy that um, we have this opportunity to uh, to devote some time at this key event to, to the topic blockchain and crypto. And the topic is how to govern decentralized digital public goods, blockchains between innovation and regulation. Um, I want to thank the organizers uh, for proposing this topic. Um, as well as inviting excellent panel participants. Um, they, they represent the variety of perspectives, uh, also variety of time zones. Um, I will want them to introduce themselves. Um, uh, please, please, uh, um, everyone uh, say a few words about yourselves um, and I will start. Um, so, as I said, my name is Jacek Czarnecki. I'm currently spending uh, this year uh, at Harvard Law School, uh, but I spent the last couple of years in the crypto space uh, working primarily for a project known as MakerDAO, which is redefining the, the future of digital money. Um, and I had the opportunity to work with um, many fantastic projects uh, in, the, in the blockchain and crypto space, which really redefine the future uh, of the internet. And personally, I'm convinced that um, this is the, um, um, the space that is going to define the future of the internet. And I hope to discuss this uh, on this panel as well. Um, and now, um, the, the, your uh, participants, please also introduce yourselves. Uh, Stephen, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, by all means. Thank you very much, Jacek. Uh, to, to begin, my name is Stephen Becker. Um, and to tell you where I'm from, I'm going to have to start with a similar journey to what Jacek has just been uh, uh, you know, talking about. Uh, I was previously the president and CEO of the Maker Foundation, which developed and deployed MakerDAO as uh, Yonatsik just uh, touched upon. And MakerDAO, um, it really is a project that um, is all about generating uh, credit. It's all about generating a stable coin, more so a decentralized stable coin um, that really kicked off the, the whole concept of DeFi. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm being a bit arrogant when I say this, but I really believe that MakerDAO is the vanguard of, of DeFi. Uh, currently, my role is as CEO of a company called UDHC. And why it was so important to tell you about MakerDAO is because the UDHC 
is bringing DeFi to the mainstream. We're looking at the, the technology and the development that basically bridges this traditional finance to the, the decentralized world so that we can create this new version of finance that not only is more inclusive and open, but more effective and efficient. Thank you, Yatsek. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Aya, do you want to go next? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Aya Miyazaki. I am Executive Director of the Zim Foundation. Um, I won't talk about what Ethereum is, so we leave it that, like, uh, that would take too, too much of time. But the Ethereum Foundation, what we do is to support everything in the ecosystem that the EF, the Ethereum Foundation, doesn't own Ethereum. I should make it very clear because it's getting confusing with other, other different uh, blockchains. But we, we support this open source project uh, mainly for the platform layer, which is we, which we believe is a common good. Um, so, so when no one owns, owns, owns it, how, how to how to support this development research in a healthy way? Um, so we we do that's the role that we are trying to do, and then also you know we encourage others to kind of join us together. So we are leading multiple projects, including uh, funding different projects that are that wouldn't be funded because it's, it's a public good work, um, and including education, including coordination. Um, so many things that doesn't happen because there is no one company who owns it. There is no one CEO who is managing the whole uh, development project. So that's. Uh, simply what we do. Um, I've been also involved in some regulatory discussions uh, in my previous work, um, as, as Utah has done those. Um, so I, uh, yeah, and then we recently, as the EF, we try to kind of support advocacy, advocacy efforts, including kind of like, you know, there's, um, technology is 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 getting more known, but the details are not really well known, and it is not like well educated. Which partially, you know, it's, it's again like because it's kind of like a decentralized way of work. But we are trying to support those groups who are doing educational work, uh, talking to policymakers and regulators, and um, and because that is very important, I, I know the importance of that because of my experience too. So I guess that, that's my um, introduction. And thank you for having me. Perfect, thanks so much, Aya. Uh, Priyama Vara, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, hi. Um, yes, I'm Priyama de Filippi. I'm a researcher at uh, the CNRS in Paris, and uh, I'm faculty associate at uh, the Bergman Klein Center at uh, Harvard Law School. Uh, I've been a researcher uh, in the crypto space uh, since quite many years now, uh, starting 2013. Um, I also have been involved uh, in a variety of uh, blockchain-based projects uh, starting with Backfeed in 2015, and then uh, I was involved in the early days of uh, DAOStack, uh, which both of them are projects um, to create platforms for decentralized organization and distributed collaboration. Uh, and then uh, I also founded Koala, which is an international network of uh, researchers, um, lawyers, and uh, engineers and uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the blockchain space, which are interested in exploring how can we bridge the gap between uh, the blockchain systems and uh, the more institutional legal systems. Um, and then finally, I'm currently working on a European project, um, which is aimed at looking at how we can use blockchain technologies, not as a way of bypassing institutions, but rather uh, as a way for institutions, but public or private, to adopt this technology as a way to enhance uh, transparency, accountability, and confidence uh, in order to eventually 
reestablish uh, or make it easier to reestablish relationship of trust within those institutions because of the greater confidence uh, within. That's great, thank you. Yuta? Yeah, uh, my name is Yuta Takanashi. Uh, I'm from Japan Financial Services Agency, the Japanese uh, Integrated Financial Regulator. Uh, I think it's a great honor to be uh, invited to this session uh, with distinguished panel fellow panelists. I'm currently serves as a director for international digital strategy and policy, managing teams uh, engaging in international work on fintech, including crypto assets, stablecoin, and decentralized finance. I myself represent uh, JFSA in various working groups and uh, the financial stability board in this field. And I also participate in the uh, blockchain governance initiative network, begin to pass better governance in the blockchain based financial system. Uh, actually, uh, for regulators, it is quite uh, challenging to deal with DeFi uh, because our current regulatory framework may not work well in achieving our regulatory goals. So, we may need to consider new ways to achieve uh, our regulatory goals, but uh, but it's very new uh, new system and new like kind of new creatures for us. So first, we need to understand what is happening and how this technology works, and also how we can like uh, manage the risks associated with them without uh, halting innovation. So I believe that we are currently in the critical moment in designing future finance and the future of the internet. And we need to enhance uh, multi-stakeholder kind of dialogue to solve issues unique to decentralized finance in collaborative manner among regulators, developers, businesses, and civil society at large. And uh, I think it's lessons learned from the experience with the internet may help us. So discussing this issue at the Internet Governance Forum has kind of special meaning to, uh, in this sense. I look forward to discussing uh, this very important and very timely topic uh, with the fellow panelists. And uh, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuta. Uh, and Lucas, please introduce yourself. Well, thank you very much. And also for me, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure to be at this distinguished panel. My name is Lukas Reper. I'm a civil servant at the European Commission working in the Directorate General Connect on industrial policy. My responsibility is to see where blockchain technologies can be used in our economy to support it with all tools that we have, but also to work with our colleagues in the financial services sector and DigiFISMA on the regulation of crypto assets, decentralized finance and so forth, contributing the technology angle. I think, uh, as Jutta has already said, uh, it is a challenge at, at some times to look at the DeFi, uh, the DeFi phenomenon from a regulatory perspective, because indeed we are no longer facing uh, a known intermediary, but we're forcing smart contracts, algorithms that are completely self-executing. So this is a completely new phenomenon for regulators. And nevertheless, despite this challenge, we also point to the to the potential, and I'm excited to discuss this today with this distinguished panel. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, Lucas. Uh, I am, again, just want to underline that I'm, I'm very happy to have all of you on the panel, not, not only because I met um, all of you at, at different stages um, over the past few years, but also I think that you're, you're the best possible panel to discuss this important topic. Uh, let me start with a very short introduction to the topic um, in, in which I will just try over like two or three minutes um, answer the question, why is that important? Um, because blockchain, um, this is something, a, a recurring topic on, on many conferences and events over many years. Um, and for, for many, this is a topic that everyone has heard about it, but no one has seen it in practice. Everyone has seen cryptocurrencies, but blockchain re for many remains a word which you know, holds or um, um, involves certain promises, um, sometimes very bold and, and important promises, but with no practical applications. This is the perception many have about this technology. Um, and it is important, very important, to understand that this is not true anymore. Um, I, actually, there are thousands of projects. Um, uh, crypto space is entering the mainstream and you've invoked a few um, instances in which this is actually happening, such as uh, DeFi or NFTs. 
And I think that what is probably most telling about where this space is going um, and also um, explains uh, uh, the phenomenon a little bit beyond this distinction between blockchain and cryptocurrencies is this notion of Web 3.0 um, as a new stage in the development of the internet, which can be allowed by the um, progress in, in and developing development of blockchains and, and crypto technologies. So we had Web 1.0, which was about reading data, about um, being able to access information. We had Web 2.0, which was all about writing and sharing information. And we had social media as a key component of the space of the development of the internet. And now what we talk about, and this is an increasingly popular um, term um, in the crypto and blockchain space is web free, uh, which is about value, uh, not just data, but value and also ownership. So from this perspective, web free uh, as allowed first by cryptocurrencies, then various other applications of blockchain technologies, including DeFi and NFTs, um, is, 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 is this new stage in the development of internet. And this is why it's it's so important to discuss this at the event such as the Internet Governance Forum. Um, personally, I'm convinced that decentralization, as we know it from cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, is coming. It is clear that this being um, this this notion of decentralization is being embraced by many industries at the moment, uh, really spilling over. At the same time, this is invisible to many. And this is different, primarily different because crypto and blockchain and Web3, these are developed by startups and independent projects, not that much by the public sector or, or big corporates. Uh, these are being developed in different ways as decentralization kind of make it, makes it necessary to use alternative forms of development and on cooperation, such as decentralized autonomous organizations, DAOs. So in a way, we see this first stage um, of the development of the internet as a completely independent and alternative one, which is rising just next to us, just next to um, the entire um, internet and technology space as we know it. This is being represented by many technologies, uh, such as Ethereum, um, which are um, as um, I think that the, the what what I already said in her introduction and what we see in the uh, funnel title is very accurate. This is about building some decentralized public goods, really decentralized networks, which are basis for other projects, more or less decentralized to develop and to change various economic or social institutions as we know them. So this is something that I was able to see while working as a lawyer in this space for many years that um, we see this uh, independent um, um, space uh, emerging, growing, um, at the same time remaining, as I said, a little bit invisible to, to, to the current, especially institutional world. At this point, we still have the chance to reconcile, so reconcile, reconcile those two. This is what Prima Vera said in her, in her introduction. We have an opportunity to work um, on integrating the current institutional system, the current economy as we know it, and society, and make it ready for the revolution that is coming from Web3, uh, from a decentralization, uh, the internet of value, and ownership, which does not require um, middlemen and intermediaries. Uh, this is why it's important, um, and um, I, I am very happy to discuss uh, these topics with, um, uh, with, with, with uh, speakers on this panel. And let me go with uh, with the first question, which I have to all of you. Um, so as I said, the, the crypto industry web three is on the rise um, and, and quickly goes into beyond financial applications, beyond cryptocurrencies, uh, beyond decentralized finance into media, art, culture, um, as uh, this is evidenced uh, by phenomena such as NFTs. But it also goes into new infrastructures for distributed cyberspace. And this is especially clear in the Ethereum space, where we see uh, various types of applications emerging and getting uh, uh, very significant traction, such as distributed domain systems or layer two rollups, which allow for greater scalability and even faster development of projects. 
and many argue that um, uh, it's it's not only necessary to remove legal obstacles for this new phenomenon and embracing decentralization. They say that um, we even need a completely new fra regulatory framework for for, for Web three. The claim is that phenomena such as decentralized autonomous organizations, so ways of um, human cooperation natively uh, on the internet uh, with token-based governance systems, these require a completely new approach in terms of, of regulation. I wanted to ask you how active should the states be in regulating Web3? Is it about just establishing some broad frameworks and allowing the space to develop by itself or what is required is active engagement in technology technology development implementation including public funding for such initiatives and i want uh, to um, start the, the answers to these questions with yuta um, who who has some excellent experience in in, in the public sector and uh, thinking about these topics okay uh, thank you for the very interesting question so and uh, actually, uh, from my personal view is that if uh, we don't uh, dislike or like uh, of this phenomenon, uh, basically we cannot uh, stop this uh, because the decentralized finance is a decentralized system is permissionless, open to everyone, and uh, autonomous, and sometimes it's anonymous. So there is no way for regulators to completely stop this development, and also. I know that very clever and very like innovative people comes into this space and this will create something, something good for the society. So we shouldn't stop this development. But at the same time, I think uh, the central system has unique like aspect that makes it uh, difficult for us regulators to achieve our regulatory goals. So like the financial stability or like uh, consumer protection, or preventing financial crimes, this uh, kind of goal is uh, still very relevant, uh, even in the decentralized system. So we need to have uh, achieved these goals because it is kind of the public good for the society without having uh, uh, stability or without any like protection for consumers or like uh, lots of uh, financial crimes may destroy the uh, society. So still we need to achieve the, our goals, but uh, the problem is how. So as, as Lucas and I have mentioned, uh, this is a very completely new uh, kind of phenomenon we are facing. So uh, in the past, uh, it is relatively easy for us to achieve our regulatory goals, just regulating banks or insurance companies as an intermediary and uh, apply the regulation and enforce regulation on them. It's, it's relatively simple, but in the decentralized system, it's much more complicated. And sometimes uh, it is still, uh, even it's difficult to find the target to regate. So we need to change our mindset. Uh, as Ayacek mentioned, um, how, how we can regulate or at least uh, achieve our regulatory goals in the Web3 or uh, decentralized finance is maybe looks very different from our current model. Like, uh, I, I like the Primavera's book, <laughs> Blockchain and Law, and I read that book more than three times. And I think the uh, Coda's Law is very interesting uh, concept. And uh, it, may be, uh, it may be necessary for us to think about how we can utilize architecture or uh, code itself to achieve our regulatory goals. But at this moment, currently, uh, it is quite like challenging to imagine how this will work with our current regulatory model or our country get uh, legal model. So we need to like have extensive discussion with, between regulators, engineers, developers, and academia and the users or civil society or all kind of uh, people in this system to find out the optimal way to <coughs> achieve our legality goals. No, I, I don't. I shouldn't say regulatory goals. <laughs> That's the goal of the society, and um, and have some common understanding what uh, should the future finance looks like, and uh, what the optimal level of control, uh, especially in the privacy or traceability kind of thing, and then find out a way to achieve these goals. Goals uh, like maybe combination of 
legal kind of rule of law and uh, architecture of code of code as law, well, or maybe the market mechanism, but uh, but still we are very in the very early stage in this discussion, and if we fail to uh, have the, the dialogue among these stakeholders, it may be possible that to regulate, because regulators have only a regulation as a tool, so we need to utilize tools we have, regulation, to achieve our regulatory goals as much as possible. This will affect greatly affect the, the industry and the, inter, uh, the community of the decentralized finance and may, may have disruptive uh, influence. I, I don't have this uh, result. So we, we should uh, have more understanding in the dialogue uh, as much as possible to find out the new ways to achieve our regulatory goals or our social goals. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yuta. Uh, this is certainly challenging to be at the forefront uh, from the from the public sector, um, and I think that uh, everyone appreciates your, your work so much um, uh, on these topics and, and the Japanese FSA in general. Uh, and Aya, uh, you, you've mentioned that um, uh, the um, advocacy efforts of the Ethereum Foundation, especially recently. So, please tell us what's your message um, to to the public sector and to the regulators, and um, what is your idea for approaching the emerging web free um thank you yes so i have a lot of messages <laughs> i've been also in the space uh for for a while you know maybe as long as prima data um it has been too but um i think it, you know looking at topics like today i often feel always that, that the question starts with what problems Web3 is making, but I think it should start with what problems Web3 is, is solving. Like there's a reason why Web3 technology was, you know, were developed. Uh, what were the problems that the world had before Web3 was invented? Why, why, why did someone even think about this? Um, and why do we care about decentralization? Like without having that process or thinking, it is impossible to actually regulate the space. But also the question of, um, I think it also depends on, so what are the laws of regulation? And that's also, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's confusing. And, and then, because, well, first of all, when you say public goods, I don't see most of the thing in blockchain are not public goods. Like when you say public goods, that are something like SNAP, like SNAP owned by a business, it's a public good. Um, so most of the stuff on, on, like in blockchain are not public goods. So that's the, the public goods work. We care so much because it's actually, we are almost like a helping uh, to, to solve problems in the world by creating this public good. It could be, built by government, it could be built by someone else, but someone needs to do this work. That's how we feel or our people feel. And, and then, in, so instead of like, a, like a focusing on the problems, like anything can have problems when, when some project is trying to work. Um, so it would be up to, of course, the regulators would have to watch, you know, like something bad so that something bad doesn't happen. Um, but that's true for anything. So I don't think this is something like a super special about Web3 thing, just because it, it is, uh, it may be, feel a little daunting because of the, you know, a lot of work are being done by decentralized way. So you can just monitor one player, but it's not built that way for for a bad intention it's built that way to really solve the, a lot of existing problems of the world so i think this has the future of solving a lot of challenges including you mentioned DeFi and nft and those are very small uh so just because the ef doesn't really control things we didn't expect anything to become like a very like a big or popular so we had no idea how NFT was going to bloom this year. But 
it, it also can be an opportunity for regular people to find, you know, like, like you know, kind of a, this is an opportunity for anyone to learn or hear about this. And what does that mean? Like, for example, there's like a, when we say DeFi, DeFi is very narrowly defined now, which I hate because decentralizing finance can be can be very broad. Um, and for example, there's a project in in Africa that I support and I, the Ethereum Foundation support. Uh, one of our fellows is working on this project to basically, you know, like a use use blockchain to to give micro insurance to farmers in in uh, in sub saharan africa in a very new way which is which is like has been almost impossible because a lot of inefficiency and middlemen and like uh, technical challenges that or infrastructure challenges this this project had before but now, so like, uh, I, I want to teach for, for everyone, not just for regulators or policymakers, but I want everyone to understand this is giving an opportunity to do things differently. And it's just one way, you know, it's not, it doesn't solve everything. But, and then also technology doesn't replace laws. Um, it, it, it's according is more like a complement. Um, so human brain, which I still believe is way more sophisticated, have to human work has to work together with coding um, so that it complements each other because both have strengths and weaknesses, which I can talk more about. Like a human makes mistakes, it can have bad intentions. Coding executes exactly as you code which is great, but at the same time, it doesn't have human intelligence, such as reading things in between lines and then uh, realize a bag before something happens. So it's like we still have to work together and this fear of code that are replacing everything. That is not happening for sure, but also that should not happen because, because like, Human human work is very very important. So that's it's kind of a confusing part when we talk, talk when people talk about online, uh, uh, sorry, on chain governance or off chain governance and all that. It's um, um, I think the part of the education that needs to happen is what part is still very just an idea stage. What part is in in an experiment stage? which I think most of the stuff is still in an experiment stage. That means, I think, policy, I hope policymakers kind of like a, you know, make effort to, to learn about what's happening very deeply, which requires technical understanding and everything. And then, and then after that, we, we to, to make the decision where to act Actually, watch or where to actually let like that things still develop. Um, and a, lot of, a lot of things are still experiments, and and I think it's it's very hard when something is regulated too much at this stage, because then that would kill all the opportunities to solve the problems of the world together. Uh, thanks so much. I think that this is a great perspective and I, I, I totally agree with you um, with respect to first not um, limiting the perspective to just specific products or uh, um, industries which are emerging. And this is very clear, especially like Web3 inherits um, this financial roots of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies um, and now also DeFi. And this is probably not right to just apply this very risk focused financial regulatory perspective to all the phenomena which Web 3.0 uh, brings, uh, that's for sure. And also putting this into the time perspective and understanding that this is long development extended over time and just taking a current snapshot of how things work is not going to contribute to a good regulatory framework. I think that these are excellent remarks. Um, Lucas, now I want to turn to you. Um, uh, and I think that you have a particular interesting perspective um, 
uh, representing the EU uh, on this panel, uh, because the EU is actually a very interesting governance um, implementation, complex governance, uh, which embraces decentralization. So I'm particularly interested in your thoughts about how the regulators and policymakers should approach the emerging uh, web free phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacek. I'll try to build a little bit on what you and I have already said. I've already said a lot and I heard a good number of messages to regulators who would like to, to pick on a little bit. I think perhaps let me break down my observations in two big clusters. I think the first, first uh, point would perhaps be, do we need to think about the regulation of decentralized finance? Or do we already have a regulatory framework that's sufficient to capture this new phenomenon? And if it's necessary to legislate or to regulate, when is the best moment? So when it comes to the first question, I think when we look at uh, decentralized finance, as it is with centralized finance, we have to think about the first basis principles. And the regulation is always there for a good reason. Regulation is there to protect certain public goods such as the protection of minors, the protections of the weaker in our society, consumer protection, financial protection is very often geared towards giving people enough information to understand the risks they take in investing, protecting minors against things. And when we look at decentralized finance, I think what we struggle with is that by accessing these completely decentralized systems that work only on the basis of algorithms, smart contracts and so forth, Consumers that connect to the systems typically do not get the same type of information they could get in centralized finance where they have to go through an intermediary, be it a bank, be it a broker, be it somebody else is providing a service. So one of the first basic principles that we're asking ourselves is, is this emerging new financial world in the internet that everybody with a wallet can access a world where consumers can get sufficient information to make a learned decision on the risks they want to take or the opportunities they want to grasp. Another big concept in these first basis principles is of course geared towards the protection against money laundering, terrorism financing. Some of the interventions we have seen already in the emerging space of decentralized finance was pressure of regulators on decentralized finance to abide by anti-money laundering rules. This is a big challenge in a completely decentralized world. But the question indeed is, where are we in this stage of the evolution of this new emerging world? Are we ready at the stage where we need to scramble to take our pen and start drawing a new, a new law? Or is this, is this a world where we should say, do no harm is the best principle, let this new world first evolve and then let's see where to intervene. I think that's a very difficult balancing exercise for regulators. Both the European Union and the United States of America have taken their time to regulate the internet. Some would argue we've taken too much time. I think as a general principle, it's a good principle to say, let's not overregulate an emerging industry in the beginning. We have seen that uh, DeFi has exploded, certainly, make a DAO 2017, $1 million of transactions. You were the front runners, but there wasn't so much money there yet. If you look at the market today, $110 billion uh, in, in total value in this market is already showing a trend that we are uh, facing a very rapid uh, evolution. So regulators will have to, to look carefully to this. But a lot of the parameters for this new Web 3.0 are still so uncertain. We've seen that non-fungible tokens have seen a certain take-up, but where is, how far does it go? Does it stop at artwork or we will see NFTs evolving further? Decentralized finance, what are really the efficiency gains compared to fully automated exchanges. We already have today exchanges, intermediaries, that are operating with fully automated order books. So what's the efficiency gain of taking away this fully automated order book with a regulated intermediary compared to one that is completely decentralized? Is it really the big step change? Where we would see really the big opportunities of decentralized finance in the first place are situations like examples that Aya mentioned. These are areas in our world where we do not have any intermediaries in the first place, where there are no matchmakers between those that want to provide finance and those that need finance, be it microcredit, be it microinsurance. And there the decentralized work can really bring enormous and undoubted benefits. However, in other parts in the world where we already have very established efficient intermediaries that are subject to regulation, the efficiency defense of decentralized finance becomes a more complex one. 
So one would need to look into the concrete situation of the environment, whether regulation is needed also to determine whether it's needed and what it should tackle. Uh, thanks so much, Lucas. I think that this uh, calibrated approach in which you actually look at what you want to regulate first uh, before adopting a specific structure um, is an excellent one. Now I want to turn to Stephen, um, who has an excellent experience in, in discussing uh, these topics with uh, policymakers and regulators around the world and international organizations such as OECD. What are your thoughts, Stephen? Um, thank you, Jacek. Yeah, this one is this one's always interesting. So. Within the UDHC, what we're looking to do is we're looking to create what I call a compliance arc of decentralization. And if you think about that phrase clearly, um, it basically encapsulates a lot of what's already been spoken about. The one part is decentralization and its applicability, and also the, the, the way that it actually, um, the way that a project starts from scratch and actually becomes decentralized. And then the important word in there was compliant. And when you think about compliance, it's all about saying, well, what are the lanes that these, these projects, these ideas need to traverse in order to be able to not only develop, but do it in such a way that makes sense for everybody. So the one thing I do wanna say is that, you know, most distributed systems in Web3, um, uh, uh, well, you know, to my mind is, is, is effectively, it lends itself to, to not being, uh, uh, requiring a more sort of focused or, or active regulation. But what it does, it sort of generalizes the concept that's already in the Web2 space about the publisher versus platform uh, regulatory paradigm, where Web3 sort of goes more into, a, a, you gotta think of it more like a service provider versus platform paradigm instead. So if you think of it as an, in terms of an example, something that we know from Web2, um, especially the paradigm of published first uh, um, uh, platform, you look at something like Twitter, who is trying to establish itself as more of a conduit of information for its users to publish information that it itself um, is not liable for, right? But if you consider Twitter as a publisher, then that company would fall under a different regulatory framework. So the parallel in the Web3 would be something like you know, a decentralized exchange, for example, where you'd see it as a platform because it really is just a conduit for user contributed liquidity. Um, the important part here, and I'm, I'm going to touch on this very briefly, is the decentralized part. You know, that has to be consistent and then has to be well-defined, almost like a Howey test needs to be applied to it. But in this example of this decentralized exchange, you know, we, we have a look at a platform, you could have an example of a whitelisted security you know, think of a digital Tesla or a digital Apple using a liquidity pool in the DEX. And then that liquidity pool by itself becomes a type of mini exchange, which would really make it uh, uh, possible for the security token issuer to be seen as a financial services provider. And what that does then is it immediately establishes a framework where it no longer looks like a platform, it actually looks like a, a, a service provider. And that means that the regulatory frameworks that are currently in place can be used. So the, the point of this is that there is actually quite a lot of regulation in place that is really applicable and can be applied to not only the centralized organizations that integrate and profit with the Web3 in the back end, but there's this, this, I call it like a new dimension to think of in that the, the, the concept of decentralized applications on permissionless blockchains creates this added infrastructure on top of the internet that really supports everyone, including really those that do not want to use an intermediary and have agency in their own actions. But at the end of the day, you know, the regulatory tools that we, that we have in place still work. All we need to do is really change the perspective when implementing them. And then that really is the case um, uh, you know, from a, a web three and, and a sort of regulatory interaction point of view. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And what I what they particularly like about this is um, this um, highlighting the fact that Web3 is not coming from um, from nowhere. Uh, it's actually like a logical step of development of the previous phases of of, of the internet, and it it benefits from from the value which was generated before. It's it's like built on top of the services that already exist, just providing additional layer of value and like literally value because it allows for for the value to exist on the internet. Uh, Prima Vera, uh, what do you think about um, uh, the, how the states should regulate Web3? 
Um, yeah, uh, I, I have a very specific view. Um, and uh, this is kind of like uh, the core of uh, this research that I'm doing um, as part of this European project. And um, uh, my view is that um, there is this, uh, first of all, of course, Web3 is subject uh, to existing regulatory framework. The problem is that uh, it is more difficult to regulate because um, there is no intermediary operator that can be easily identified. Um, and so it is always possible to try and find who are the closest intermediaries. Uh, but there's also the, the problem that when uh, the cost of compliance uh, are too high, then it might also encourage uh, the creation of more and more decentralized systems. Uh, and we can see it with uh, the fire, with uh, tornado cash, etc. And we've seen this uh, back in the days also uh, with the internet and the development of peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing networks that try to escape uh, increasing re regulations. And so uh, the, the idea of, of uh, decentralization can also be a way uh, of actually trying to not have to comply with this very uh, difficult regulation sometimes to, to comply, especially when the system is constructed as a decentralized system. Um, at the same time, um, so there is this kind of like race uh, between decentralization and then regulation that tries to regulate this decentralized infrastructure and then further decentralization that is being deployed as, a, as an answer. Um, but at the same time, it is also possible to adopt a more uh, collaborative approach to actually incentivize uh, regulatory compliance. Um, and this can be done via um, functional equivalence or regulatory equivalence, meaning that um, especially with blockchain technology, it is possible to create technological guarantees that can actually achieve similar uh, policy or regulatory objectives as existing regulatory framework. And especially as regulation, especially in finance, uh, but in general is, is designed as a way of minimizing or distributing risk. Um, if the risk that the regulation is intended to tackle can actually be reduced by technological means, uh, in particular with regard to counterparty risk and so forth, then it is possible if one adopts those technological guarantees to perhaps benefit from um, a lower uh, formalities or regulatory burden. And so for me, one interesting way in which governments can actually tackle uh, the regulation of this technology is actually by providing uh, spaces of experimentation, such as, for instance, regulatory sandboxes, uh, inviting the actors of that are operating in the space uh, to actually identify solutions, to let them explore ways in which the rule of code uh, can actually implement the rule of law. Um, but of course, this needs legal incentives, right? And, um, and I think this is especially relevant as more and more of those Web3 applications are actually eager to interact with more established existing institutional frameworks and, and legal system. And so, by the, the incentive is by actually adopting specific technological guarantees, by finding uh, technological guarantees which can be regarded as being functionally equivalent to specific regulation, then they benefit from a lower uh, regulatory burden because the policy objective is already uh, resolved via the technological solution. And on that note, um, I would like to mention the work that uh, uh, we've been doing uh, with Koala uh, with regard to the DAO model law, for instance. And the idea was uh, exactly this. It, it is difficult for a government to say, here is how DAOs need to be implemented. Uh, however, it is possible for a government to say, if DAOs implement this particular set of criteria, then we will recognize uh, for instance, some kind of limited, uh, some legal personality or some kind of limited legal liability because uh, the specific rules that are enshrined into the code of those, of those smart contracts are actually achieving the same objective that uh, existing corporate rules um, are intended to achieve. And, um, 
And we're already seeing this like, for instance, like in Belgium, which is now working on the implementation of uh, uh, DAO's worker bills, right? So in order to help people that are working for DAOs to somehow be able to declare uh, what they are doing. And so the idea here is really like, instead of trying to uh, find ways to regulate uh, the existing decentralized ecosystem, it's, uh, it's more like the, the carrot approach, which is, well, we, we can provide specific incentives, legal incentives uh, to fulfill specific requirements, which we as regulator uh, consider to be functionally equivalent to existing formalities or existing regulatory obligations, but that are achieved via technological means. And then it is up for the, uh, the blockchain developers and, and entrepreneurs to decide, well, actually I want to benefit from this uh, uh, lesser regulatory burden. And therefore I will implement my systems in a way that actually comply with those requirements. Thanks so much, Pernavera, especially that it brings us directly to um, the second question, which I think you have already answered uh, in some way. Um, I wanted to ask about the governance of decentralized systems and the, the great challenges that, that it poses. Um, because like the early approach in, in, the, in, in Web3 and in the crypto space was to apply the principle which you mentioned called this law, which is basically about not referring to the external legal system for anything, and just relying on the on the code of specific structures for resolving problems uh, or disputes that are emerging. Um, and the question was, should the law adapt to, to, um, to, to architectures emerging within distributed systems and go beyond their code, the slow approach, and actually try to adopt the law, the actual law, which will govern the structures. And I understand your, um, uh, your a carrot rather than stick approach um, I, uh, that that makes a lot of sense uh, to, to apply to the structure to kind of encourage them to come to, to the um, established legal system, especially that all of those decentralized organizations, in order to function the real world and to interact with the real world, they will probably need to play along the rules, which means some form of interactive with legal systems. So my question to everyone, um, if if uh, if you could spend um, maximum two minutes each for answering the question if code is low is enough and if not how the law uh, can can actually regulate the centralized structures to you primavera just just one follow-up question because you largely answered this already um is like do you think that the carrot is not so the stick is not needed at all to, to effectively govern the structures um maybe I, maybe i start um, yeah, I think I think the stick is always there in the sense that the existing regulatory frameworks are always there, uh, and uh, if uh, if if we can identify specific intermediaries, and there are of course intermediaries that can be held uh, liable, and therefore that um, that of course needs to follow with the regulations, then of course they will be subject to the stick. Uh, for me, however, especially as we move towards increasing decentralized system, uh, the carrot become the most uh, uh, effective tool. Uh, because if we, if, if we use the stick, uh, the reaction might actually be uh, destructive in the sense that the reaction might be cr the creation of even further decentralized and even system that are even harder to regulate. Uh, whereas if we actually adopt the carrot approach, then the ecosystem itself will try to come closer. And, uh, and of course, as, as there is more and more adoption, uh, there, is, there is an actual real desire uh, by many blockchain-based applications and, and DAOs and so forth to have a capacity to interact directly with the legal system. And this is a very strong incentive, and so this is a very strong carrot. Um, and of course, the, the, the only way they can interact with those, uh, those systems in a, in a legally compliant way is that the legal system recognize them, right? And in order to be recognized, then they might need to comply with specific regulation, but those regulations can be translated into specific technological guarantees. And if the design 
is such as to comply with those guarantees, then they can benefit from this legal recognition and then they can interact with the legal system. And then it's kind of a win-win for everyone, right? Uh, that totally makes sense to me. So now uh, let me let me switch to on uh, the public sector and Utah. Your work, um, uh, partially at least, has been focused on on these topics um, as as part of begging or other initiatives. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So, and uh, to my understanding, if the code is actually law, then we need to think about how we can create code because usually the law reflects kind of politics. Uh, reflecting different values and like solving the politics among different uh, stakeholders and then create law, uh, the rule of law world. We need to solve the politics and we need to like reflect different values into the law. And then if the code is law in the decentralized system, we need to like invite different, uh, like people who have different like, uh, values or uh, like stakes into the, the process of the coding kind of thing. So designing the code itself. So, so I, at this moment in the decentralized system or Web3 or decentralized finance, uh, only the, the developers create code and the code reflects their values. But it is still unclear whether this uh, code reflects very different stakes or very different values in in the similar way as the current legal system, then we need to have some kind of the meta level <laughs> like regulation, the meta level like uh, law or like uh, at least governance kind of thing to like actually like make the process of code developing more like a similar way as we are doing in the legal system or national diet kind of system. So, so if the if the code becomes a law in the decentralized system, we need to have meta level like rules or the the mechanism to like reflect defined values in the system. At, at this moment, this kind of mechanism is not in place. So this will, will make some problems in the system. So like uh, we we understand the financial inclusion is very important. But uh, but of course we need to exclude someone from financial system like the terrorists or <laughs> like criminals. But how we can decide who is a criminal or who is the terrorist uh, in the decentralized system is very unclear. So this kind of like different views. Some people say the government shouldn't decide who is a criminal or who is a the terrorist. But uh, at least we need to think about how we can decide and how we can like distinguish between people who should access the financial system and who shouldn't access the financial system. This this is the kind of politics balancing between like privacy or traceability is also the like different values. No right or not right or bad, uh, right or uh, uh, wrong, but but it we need to resolve this kind of conflict in the political system. If, if the code is low, we, this governance system should have some, some mechanism to resolve this kind of different values. That is my opinion. Thanks so much. Uh, staying conscious of time, uh, I, I encourage very short responses to the question. Uh, so, so Aya, please, please go ahead. Please tell us yeah. if, uh, if, if you've ever proposed um, some coding lessons to regulators. Sure, yeah, I will keep it short. I, as I said before, I don't think coding is replacing laws. It, it depends, right? Because it's just a tool. If lawyers or policymakers, whoever decides to use coding for the purpose of regulating, that you can do that. For example, Ethereum is a programmable blockchain. Like you can program in any each application has each different governance system, which like you can build it in any way, right? So it's totally up, just a tool, right? So like how you want to make the governance is really up to the, the people. And then it can actually, this can really help regulators to regulate, like, or this can help. But existing legal system has problems. We need to admit that. And that's why there are new ways of 
governance or new ways of like uh, people call it smart contracts, but it's not really a contract. It's really just like, you know, like coding is executing things. So that can totally supplement existing legal systems that are not working. For example, like the COVID uh, like restrictions and the, the whole like a global working together is such a mess. And, and because the global coordination is really hard. So we need new, new technology to help with that kind of coordination. And like actual public policy is perfect for, I think, cross border. Uh, coordination too. So it's just a supplemental uh, tool for any 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 system. It's not just legal system. So it can it can help with um, with the legal system too. Thanks so much. What do you think, Stephen? Um, be very conscious of time. I'm going to keep this incredibly, incredibly short. I think this is just a change in perspective. Um, it's actually pretty simple. When you think about it, a lot of these systems are actually designed to, to work by themselves. And it's really about how folks choose to engage with these systems. So consequently, the simplicity is this. If you decide to engage with um, one of these, one of these um, systems sitting on a permissionless blockchain directly via uh, a command line interface, what you're doing is you're electing to engage directly with the code. In that extent, code is law. Why? Because you have taken upon yourself to engage it. You've taken yourself sovereignty, your agency, and you've said, I want to engage with this code and what comes of it comes of it. Um, I have opted out in this instance. I haven't opted out of being a citizen. I haven't opted out of anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist or proliferation financing. I've opted out of invest in consumer protection. That's what I've opted out on. But if I decide to go and engage with one of these systems through a regulated front end or front end controlled by a central party, then I have opted in. I've asked for my consumer protection, I've asked for my investor protection, and I have basically acknowledged full front that I have a counterparty to recourse to. And that basically allows for the application of you know, current regulation as we have it. Now, I make it sound simple, but there's obviously a spectrum in between. And one of those aspects that really define the system is how decentralized this thing is that you are um, operating with and to what extent you are engaging at a level of code. Hopefully that was short enough. Perfect, thank you. Uh, that, that's, that's something that I think is one of the most important messages to regulators to understand the various layers and also the degrees of uh, centralization or decentralization applicable to each of them. And Lucas, uh, finally a question to you because I think that the yeah, EU Commission's work on smart contracts um, and recognizing the novel uh, ways of, of governance is, is particularly relevant. Uh, what do you think? Well, generally speaking, I think we've seen that technologies very often operate at the beginning in the legal vacuum. This is not the first time, although the phenomenon of the centralized finance is of course, is of course novel. And over time, the question is what adapts? Is it the technology that adapts to the law or is it rather the law that has to adapt to the, to the technology? And I think the answer is that very often it's a two-way direction. So if actors in completely decentralized systems want to have the benefits, certain benefits that exist today for centralized actors, such as limited liability in partnerships, then they will have to appoint a regulatory access point to speak to a regulator in some form. If they don't want to operate in this framework, they will, they will have certain disadvantages, but it will operate in a different way. I think when we as European policymakers look at this phenomenon, we have every interest to seize the opportunities to support the developments here with an enabling legal framework, an enable legal framework, for instance, by creating legal certainty for legal transactions in decentralized systems, for NFTs in representing physical assets, how do we transfer ownership with NFTs in the real world and so forth. There is a lot to be done for policymakers, but there is also a lot of thinking that should go on in the fully decentralized world because there are legitimate interests and my colleague Yuta has referred to them. We have a democracy, we have the rule of law, we have courts. If they're completely bypassed through a new financial system, society will find a way to react to that. So it is, I think, in, in the best interest of the industry to take a step forward towards regulators and policymakers, while also for the policymakers to have an open ear and to listen to those that bring forward the innovation. 
Uh, thanks so much, Lucas. And I think that this is an excellent um, summary and words to, to finish our panel. Uh, thanks so much um, to all of the speakers on the panel and also to the organizers for having us. Um, wishing you uh, a fruitful day of, of uh, other discussions on the future and the governance of internet. Thank you.